All right, welcome to the uh, second half of the potential energy surface as a preamble to the basic force field. So this is computational chemistry, Chem 4021, and this is video 2.2 .2 in Roman notation. Uh, so last time we examined some simple potential energy surfaces and slices through potential energy surfaces as a way of conceptually relating molecular structure to energy, and I said that uh, that would ultimately be useful for thinking about more complex chemical concepts like equilibria, for instance, or, or reaction uh, dynamics. So I'd like to explore a little more deeply the relationship between this topological construct, the potential energy surface, and, uh, and these chemical concepts. And so let me begin by looking at some of the deeper aspects that are sort of hidden within the the potential energy surface formulation. So one interesting uh, way to think about the, the uniqueness of the potential energy surface is, uh, and when I say uniqueness, I mentioned before that we associate with a given molecular structure and energy. And I want to make clear that that is actually a, an approximation or an assumption, I guess we might say, that depends in a very fundamental way on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And so I think what you'll remember of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is uh, it's usually invoked kind of early in chemistry, and it rests on the fact that the electrons are very much lighter in mass than our nuclei. And as a result, one can usually think if the nuclei are moving in space, they're trundling along, carrying their huge mass, the electrons, which are very nimble, zooming around about them, are always relaxed in terms of their positions. And of course, electrons are sort of tricky, so when you say position, what you really sort of mean is a, a distribution of probable positions, but we'll get to quantum mechanics a little later. In any case, the electrons are relaxed relative to the nuclei. And so what that really means is, when I say I have a molecular geometry, I don't have to worry about how I got the atoms to those positions. The point is, those are their positions, and the electrons are relaxed to those positions. They're not lagging along behind because I was zooming the nuclei in from one direction or another. And so indeed, if, if you want to really get on top of that, you might imagine to yourself, how would the energetics be different in just a diatomic if there were no Born-Oppenheimer approximation? And so I'll think about, I want to get to a bond length of 1.5 angstroms. So what might be different if I get to 1.5 angstroms by suddenly moving the atoms together from 20 angstroms apart compared to suddenly moving them to 1.5 angstroms from 0.1 angstrom apart? If it weren't for the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, how would things be different? Why, how would the energy at 1.5 angstroms that you instantaneously reach or very, very quickly from those uh, initial starting locations differ? So it's just something to think about. Maybe we can discuss that in class. It's also worth noting that the potential energy surface is a classical construct with respect to the nuclei. Right? We are claiming to know the positions of the nuclei infinitely finely. Right? They are at some point in space that I can specify to as many digits as I'd like in uh, whatever length units I might like in, say, a Cartesian space. However, quantum mechanics is captured in the electronics. That is, I'm, I am allowing these electrons to relax to the nuclear positions, and uh, as a result, I actually should specify when I talk about a potential energy surface, which electronic state am I talking about? Mo mostly we're going to be interested in ground states, but there may be many electronic states for a given geometry, and each one of those states will have associated with it its own potential energy surface, so you have to be a bit careful when you discuss that. But we're not going to talk much about electronic excited states for a few weeks yet. So in any case, classical nuclei, that is, we aren't trying to describe the nuclear positions with a probability distribution. And happily, because nuclei are, are mostly quite heavy, with the exception of maybe hydrogen, uh, that's often a perfectly fine way to think about it. And then finally, a, a very important aspect that we will deal with later in the course is the potential energy surface really deals with a single molecule, right? When, when you go in the lab and you do measurements of thermodynamic quantities, you usually will talk about things like enthalpy or entropy or free energy. It's, it's quite rare you hear anybody tell you anything about the potential energy of a chemical system. And that's because 
those thermodynamic uh, quantities come from measurements on large numbers of molecules, collections of molecules, ensembles of molecules, I guess we might say. And we will get to that later, but for now I'm happy to work with sort of a single molecule quantity, and when you do have a single molecule you can talk about its potential energy. Let me mention a few other aspects of the potential energy surface that are often uh, you know, not fully appreciated, not considered as one is looking at it, but that are, are worth bearing in mind. And so the first one is that, by its very name, it is a potential energy surface. So there is no effort when making a potential energy surface to indicate in any way anything about the kinetic energy that may be associated with uh, the individual molecule or a collection of atoms, anyway, that's defining that surface. And so, uh, you know, a way of thinking about dynamics to some extent is you might imagine your molecule to be a little ball and it's rolling on the potential energy surface. And you see the ball roll downhill, because that's what balls do in, in our macroscopic world. And when one watches a ball perhaps rolling around on a surface, and you know you would start it from a high energy position, it's going to roll down, it's going to roll back up, and then it's going to roll down again, and it's going to explore different places. And if you think to yourself, ah, when the ball is lower, in the wells on my potential energy surface, it is at lower energy. Well, that's just not true, right? We, uh, we know that energy is conserved. What's happened, of course, is there's been a distribution of energy into the potential energy and the kinetic energy. And so when you drop along the surface, yes, your potential energy goes down, but your ball will be moving at a higher speed, and that's kinetic energy. And so on a frictionless surface, you'd have constant energy, and you did, that ball would just always be in motion. And so for uh, cases where we want to think about all of the energy, we're going to have to keep track of kinetic energy, and that's something we'll get to when we talk about dynamics, mostly. At a temperature of zero degrees Kelvin, nominally no kinetic energy, let's not worry about zero point energy yet, uh, the rules of the universe say that your molecule wants to be at the lowest possible potential energy. So it'll be at the minimum on the potential energy surface. And we're sort of lucky that we live on a planet where, although the temperature is not absolute zero, even on a bad day in Minnesota, uh, we're really at relatively low temperatures. And as a result, molecules, to the extent they have uh, sort of anthropomorphic tendencies, are spending most of their time in regions of a potential energy surface that are close to minima. So from a computational chemistry standpoint, if we want to construct potential energy surfaces because they're so useful, one of the things we'd like to be able to do is find minima and find them efficiently because that's likely to be a good description of what molecules are like in a laboratory at 298K. And then another kind of important piece of a potential energy surface is if I want to go from one minimum to another, and a minimum, topologically speaking, you can think of that as being like a valley. Of course, we have really high dimensionalities, and it's hard to imagine a 64-dimensional valley, for instance, but, you know, stretch your mind and give it a shot. If I want to get between two minima, I will have to go uphill from one, and ultimately, I will get to a highest energy point before I can begin going downhill to another. And if I arrange for that point to, in fact, be lowest in energy in all the other directions, except the one that's taking me from one valley to another, well, that would be called a saddle point. And in chemistry, we, we call that a transition state structure. And I want to be a bit careful here, and I want you to start trying to be careful, that point on the potential energy surface, and we'll say more about its kind of topological characteristics later, but it's a point. The point is called a transition state structure. Transition state, without saying the word structure, should usually be uh, reserved for thinking about uh, collections of molecules, ensembles of molecules, because there may not be just a single structure, it's, it's more a property of a group of molecules. But that one point on the potential energy surface, let's always agree to call that a transition state structure or a TS structure. And uh, certainly it'd be nice to have ways to find those too, because that's going to tell us something about chemistry. 
And in particular, with, with that in mind, now let's actually look at one of these topological surfaces. So here is some surface, and of course all I can usually do is a slice, so I've got two arbitrary coordinates here. I haven't even bothered labeling them, but there's some sort of structural coordinates, and here's my energy. And so here it is in space, and I've got uh, a dark line that I've illustrated on here, and that might be some path I am choosing to map out on this potential energy surface. And so right here is a little valley, right? It's a little minimum. And here's another valley on the surface, a minimum. And the relative energies of these two valley bottoms, so it looks like this one is a little bit lower than this one, could in principle be used to determine an equilibrium constant, right? So the equilibrium constant is equal to exponential minus the difference in energy divided by RT. Now this is a little bit sloppy, as any uh, thermodynamicist would tell you, and actually many of you might recall that this probably should be delta G, not delta E. So this is one of those thermodynamic free energies, and that's associated with a collection of molecules, whereas here I'm using delta E, which is for one molecule. Well, you know, one molecule can't really be in equilibrium in two different ways. It's either one or the other. But let's, let's be a little bit fast and loose and just say that this is going to be a, a good approximation for what the equilibrium constant can be, or it certainly can be a good approximation. And then in addition, I, I did try to draw this line so that sure enough, it went over a highest energy point, which is lowest energy in the other dimension. So you see, if I were to track along the orthogonal coordinate, orthogonal to this reaction coordinate, it is going up in this direction, and it's going up in this direction. So this is a true transition state structure, a saddle point on the potential energy surface, and uh, that makes it interesting. And it turns out there's a theory, it's called transition state theory, that should give us some information about the rate constant, so this is a rate constant, for the transformation of this minimum going to this minimum, and it's equal to some constants up front, that's Boltzmann's constant, the temperature, Planck's constant, exponential, so here's another one of these exponential to an energy. In this case, it's the delta E double dagger, so that's the energy difference between the transition state structure and the local minimum. And again, divided by the universal gas constant, R, and temperature. And once more, of course, we really should be careful and we should do this with free energy and not with individual molecule potential energy, but uh, for notional purposes, that's useful. So uh, we, we've just talked about equilibrium constants, rate constants. I mean, that's real chemistry. That's why these potential energy surfaces have such power. Okay, so here's, here's what you should be thinking about as we begin to transition into real computational chemistry. It's obvious these things are useful. How on earth can I build them or measure them or somehow, you know, create them? And in order to get at these really useful chemical concepts like equilibrium constant and rate constant, Actually, I didn't need much of the surface. I, I only really needed to know something about the critical points, the minima and the saddle points. So from a calculus perspective, you would call those critical points. They're places where the slope is zero, uh, and you could find them by doing standard differential calculus. So is there a way to find them without actually mapping out an entire surface in detail? And then there's the interesting question, well, but if I don't do the whole surface, and I've got a, you know, reasonably complex molecule, maybe it's got a lot of atoms, how do I know where all the critical points are? There could be a lot of different ways to put those atoms together that generate minima. Which ones are lower and which ones are higher? And, you know, for every new minimum, there might be a transition state structure that connects it to all of the other minima, so those start to kind of grow quickly as well. How do I find all these things? Well, let me uh, close this section by saying a little bit about how one might go about it experimentally as opposed to computationally. And so uh, the experiments are by no means easy, so let's, let's start with the simplest possible case, and that'll be a one-dimensional potential energy surface. Okay, so we're going to go after a, the one-dimensional surface as a bond stretch, if you recall. So we're going to take hydrogen chloride, and uh, maybe some of you have done this as a physical chemistry lab experiment. I know I did when I was an undergraduate. You take a little cell of HCl, and you put it in your infrared spectrometer as a gas. And because it's a gas, you get a nice rotationally resolved uh, vibrational spectrum. And so this is the spectrum you get for, uh, 
for HCL, and so you've got some rotational levels, you've got a fundamental vibrational uh, uh, transition in here that you don't see because it's uh, not allowed, zero, zero. But anyway, quantum mechanics tells us that vibrational energy levels are quantized, so the absorption that gives rise to a transition from the ground vibrational state to the first excited vibrational state takes place at this energy. So there is uh, some energy associated with this wavelength of light that's being absorbed. And so that'll tell you the separation between the vibrational levels. And we also know from quantum mechanics that the uh, position of the levels depends on the the uh, reduced mass of the molecule, so I know what the molecule is, that's not hard, and it depends on the bond force constant. And so the force constant, if you will, is a measure of how does the energy change as a function of bond length. Now, I can do this not only for HCl, but I could actually also do it for DCl, so I, that's in the undergraduate uh, physical chemistry lab experiment, I remember doing that one as well. Uh, and with isotopes, because they'll have different reduced masses, but not necessarily very different force constants, you will be able to uh, observe different sorts of transitions between different energy levels and potentially map out a potential energy surface. That was too many potentialies, but anyway, uh, let's look at that in practice. So here, that, that experiment I just showed you would give you, I, I'm going to try to determine RAB. And all I know at the moment is that the energy increases by this much, so that was that fundamental transition I just measured, uh, for going from the ground vibrational state to the first excited vibrational state. And quantum mechanics gives me an idea of, given that reduced mass, what must be the shape of a parabola, that's the standard quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator approximation, what would a parabola have to look like to have that separation between vibrational energy levels? And if I go and I do DCL instead of HCL, so it's going to have lower zero point energy, if you remember your quantum mechanics, and it'll have a smaller separation between levels as well, but uh, that will also give me some idea of the shape of the potential energy surface. And, you know, I may actually shine in strong enough light that I will observe not merely the allowed transition from zero to one, but I could see the formally forbidden transition from the ground vibrational state to the second excited vibrational state. And that'll give me another energy level. And I also might work hot so that I have things that are just thermally in the first excited state, and I can watch them absorb allowedly into the second excited state. Again, just mapping out all these energy levels. And if I do some nifty laser spectroscopy and I've added in some more isotopes, I can in principle get a whole lot of different levels. And maybe I'm actually watching emission as well as absorption. Anyway, I'm mapping level after level after level. Well, now I don't necessarily have to use the uh, crude approximation of a parabola, I can in fact use higher order polynomial expressions in quantum mechanics to figure out what must a curve look like in order to place vibrational energy levels at all of these positions. And so finally the spectroscopist armed with all these energy levels will be able to draw a curve that'll be a quite accurate representation of the potential energy associated with this bond stretch. It's going to have a minimum here at uh, some so-called equilibrium bond distance, so REQ is the bottom of the curve, and uh, that's really how uh, an experimentalist goes after this sort of uh, potential energy surface fitting. So with that in mind, uh, we are going to start next time, uh, in the next video, we'll start looking at techniques to generate potential energy surfaces computationally using uh, arithmetic protocols, essentially. And so I'm going to leave you with uh, breathless anticipation, I know, waiting to view the next video, and we'll also have a chance to do some discussion in class. See you then.